Mm -hmm. Hey guys, we are with Dr. Merit Moore. Thank you so much for uh, joining. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. I was looking over some of the things that you've done and I'm very excited. I have a lot of questions. I know you studied uh, physics in Harvard and then you went on to study atomic uh, physics in uh, Oxford University. And you're also a ballet dancer at the National Norwegian uh, uh, Ballet. Uh, so is it National Norwegian Ballet Arts Center or is it just the ballet? Uh, yeah, there's the, so I danced there with the Norwegian National Ballet. So after, um, it was risky to do my PhD in my twenties, like right after college, because mm -hmm. um, since dance was a huge passion of mine um, and that's, you know, it's it's hard. I had these two passions, physics and dance. And but the twenties is your like supposedly your prime years for dancing. Um, so I jumped in and did the PhD in my twenties. And after my PhD, it was one of those moments where I was like, you know, like man, did I just kind of shoot myself in the foot a little bit? And will I ever be able to dance professionally again? Um, and so I just put you know head down and worked my butt off training and then uh, magically four months after I submitted my thesis I was invited by Norwegian National Ballet to come and uh, finally the director told me she was like look we were not auditioning anyone but the fact that you had a PhD we were like we just need to like audition ourselves <laughs> who knew that my <laughs> physics PhD was going to get me into the door to audition for a ballet company so the most recent ballet company was Norwegian National Ballet Company and previously danced with Zurich Ballet, Boston Ballet, and English National Ballet. Interesting. And just to contextualize the conversation, can you uh, walk us through your journey as well? So what made you, you know, find interest in, in ballet and, and then kind of mixing, mixing it in with the physics and science as well? Because I really appreciate these intersections. And I wanted to know, you know, how does the intersection of art and science look like for you? How did that journey start? So I think within me, both of those felt so natural, both dance and physics. Mm -hmm. um, I was that type of kid that was very quiet. And I mean, my mother says I didn't talk till I was three. And even then I kind of said the bare minimum of like in order in terms of communication, like I would express myself more with my body and be like, yeah. <laughs> like, or like um, rather than articulating with words. So I think both, dance and physics won me over um, because <laughs> they avoided words at all costs. It was like, you know, body movement or uh, physics equations. And so for me, I think I found both of those quite natural, like a, a um, natural uh, kind of uh, integration of the two. Society and the prejudices surrounding it kept those passions very separate. So mm -hmm. for most of my life, I da started dancing at 13, which is late. And I was told I would never make it as a professional dancer. But having started dance at 13 and physics around 17, uh, it, my whole life that I'd been pursuing it for over a decade, um, it was, during that time, I was told, you know, that they were very separate. So although in myself, I felt like it was quite natural to love these two things, society made it quite difficult. So like when I was dancing, I wouldn't really mention that I was pursuing physics. And in the physics world, I wouldn't really mention that I was dancing because there was like this weird kind of um, mentality that if you're pursuing another passion, it meant that you weren't dedicated to that one field and you were like disloyal to it. So um, yeah, so f in myself, I felt like it was quite natural and yeah, like a, a dance. I was bribed though into my first dance class by my mother. Um, she just wanted me to take like six ballet lessons to fix my posture. Right. And then she said I could go to karate. Um, but when I entered the dance studio and started like felt the music and was, and I had a very hard teacher. So I was like, oh, actually this is, this is quite difficult. <laughs> like this isn't, you know, I was a bit of a tomboy. Um, and I was like, oh, actually, this is kind of way harder than any other activity I've ever done. You know, I had a Russian ballet teacher who was like, oh, keep your leg up. Um, and I just loved it so much and so stayed with it. And 
and physics as well. I just was fascinated with the mysteries of the universe and wanted to be part of the, you know, group and, and part of the researchers that were kind of discovering and exploring and investigating them. Interesting. Yeah, you mentioned a few interesting points I want to touch on. So obviously society does tend to kind of separate things and put them into buckets. So if yeah. you're someone in the science world, if you're a physicist, uh, then you can't necessarily be someone who's interested or keen in arts, which yeah. I find very weird as well, but it's maybe society's way of placing labels on people and quickly mm -hmm. putting them into buckets uh, right yeah. away. Yeah. And I, I really do appreciate the fact that you, you know, went on to pursue both. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was looking over this bar Barishna bot that, that, you, <laughs> that, that you've been working on. Yeah. Is this yeah. something that you built, you know, during the lockdown? Uh, can you tell us a little about that? <laughs> yes. So my robot dance partner um, has multiple names. One of them is Barishna bot. Um, so I... To, I think uh, for a little backstory on it is, yeah, I finished my PhD, then was dancing with Norwegian National Ballet mm -hmm. and has, have always been intrigued by technology and, the, and, and also the art side and was investigating how does technology inspire human creativity and inspire new choreography. And I think the ballet world is a bit backwards in a lot of ways. And, um, and so I was always curious about, you know, how, how does technology kind of enhance or, or what can be done in the fusion of these two worlds that maintains that human, authentic, emotional aspect of the art form, um, but keeps it fresh and lively and um, new. And so I was kind of exploring. And when I was at Norwegian National Ballet, a friend of a friend said that they were working with robots. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> Can I come and play? <laughs> so after like rehearsals and in between performances, I would go and like start exploring movement. And it's this six jointed industrial robotic arm. Mm -hmm. um, and I was playing around with it. And then Harvard Art Lab, which is this new space um, that allows artists to research, invited me as one of their first artists in residence to explore more of this. Mm -hmm. And this was in January and February, right before COVID. And then I was, uh, COVID hit and I was in lockdown. And it was one of those moments where I think people can relate, you know, there was that like anxiety, uncertainty, kind of fear of like, what is going on? Um, all of my dance gigs got canceled, but I'm a big believer that with every challenge, there's an incredible opportunity. And so I was just like, what, you know, okay, can't train, can't do live performances. W what am I going to do? Um, and it just dawned on me. I was like, hmm, funny. I was just dancing with a rope, like creating movement with a robot, like, <laughs> who knew a robot could be my only potential dance partner for a very long time. And so I had the robot come to my apartment and um, started creating movement. So during this lockdown or well, like starting in August, it took a little couple of months of persuasion. Of course, I can <laughs> um, imagine. Yeah. Company. I was like, Hey, do you universal robotics? You want to lend me a robot? Um, and they, you know, at first they were like, no, <laughs> who are you? I was like, but actually, um, so they were going to lend it to me for just two weeks and then, then a month and then it continued on. Like, I think they uh, liked the content that I was creating and now it's been a, an incredible collaboration. Um, and, and so the, yeah, that was my lockdown was investigating movement with this industrial robotic arm. And I'm, I'm so grateful to Universal Robotics for being so generous and lending me the robot and allowing me that time and space because I think it's what kept me sane mm -hmm. during a very difficult time. I'm sure, I'm sure. And it's, it's interesting because I feel like you opened up the doors mm -hmm. to many other people starting to explore uh, you know, different movements, whether it's in ballet or any other sort of 
sport that you know requires uh, you to have a partner or to, to be in a group to to do but now with the lockdown it's it's difficult so that's interesting so yeah so i wanted to i also wanted to know harvard arts lab what else what else what else do you do there is it only this one project that you've been working on or do you have any other projects that you have in line with them what's the future looking like there uh, they're brand new and it's amazing i'm so i think there are certain things that harvard does that i'm i'm very um that i think are just super cool and and this is one of them i think that for artists there's always this pressure that you need to create have a finish a deadline like a, a completed project within mm -hmm. a certain amount of time like you have to have an exhibition or a performance and there's this time crunch and there's this money crunch and for this space they actually don't want you to do an ex exhibition they don't want you to have a final product at the end mm -hmm. it's purely it's a, it's a space for research which is amazing because i would never if someone told me i needed a performance and or a set thing to show people within a month, I think I would go with, I would stick with what I know, right? I would stick with something that I know would have it, that I could present. Mm -hmm. Whereas playing with robots and AI, like, and we were doing this um, so that it was interactive and connecting with the, these HTC Vive hand, like these VR handsets. And um, we never would have attempted that if there was that deadline. Um, and so it was just this amazing space. My residency ended right before the COVID. Um, and so, and I think right now this year they've been closed because um, of everything that's going on. But that is, yeah, that's, that's the project I'm working on there. And there are various other projects that I'm working on. One is um, not directly with the Harvard Art Lab, but, you know, working with um, virtual reality particularly in the education space, particularly um, physics, but also in artistically, like how do you make physics more fun, right? Like, yeah, yeah. want it like a video game or want it like aesthetically pleasing rather than like memorizing facts from a textbook um, or working, yeah, uh, creating, yeah, lots of fun projects. I I'm, I'm I'm very excited for those because I feel like it's very important to you know make a lot of strides and progress within this particular field and I mean education really because yeah it seems like technology has advanced a lot but education or the integration of technology within education to facilitate training to make sure that children want to learn and they're excited about learning the yeah. fundamentals the principles that's really missing right yeah i think universally right i i am um, and it's a it's a question that i have been thinking about a lot over the past couple of months mm -hmm. and would be so eager to talk to others about um and explore more but i think universally everyone is unhappy with the education system i don't think anyone is like oh we've got this education system down like I think everyone sees the flaws in it and are like, why are we doing these standardized testing? Why? Like, it's just ridiculous, right? Um, but I think it's very easy to complain about a system and very difficult to find a solution to a system. Sorry. Um, so I think, yeah, so these are questions. And especially during this lockdown, I've started this group called the SciArt Party. Um, SciArt Party, okay. Yeah. So it's, it was during lockdown, um, just sensing, cause I have a, a young following as well, that there was like a sense of loneliness and lack of hope. And so wanted thought, oh, okay, well, this is an opportunity to connect with science artists around the world um, or introduce scientists with artists or people who are interested in both or people who are vaguely interested in them. And we created these events that thought we thought, uh, you know, only 30 or 40 people would sign up which was great, which we were super excited. Ended up in like uh, two days, we had over 200 people. And then on the third day, 400 people signing up. Um, so we realized that actually there was this need and desire for a space where people could feel free and um, unapologetically themselves in pursuing both of these things. Mm -hmm. And 
So we have this very large community and a wonderful team of 17 people and a new podcast, um, Poolside Polymaths podcast coming out. Um, but it, but we want to go into that education space. And so it's exploring, yeah, what, what are the solutions? You know, what are the different things to, uh, yeah, how, how does a new education system look like? And it's, it's, it's quite a difficult question. <laughs> It is, it is a difficult question and it's a big challenge. And I respect the fact that there are groups actually working towards understanding what are the current challenges and uh, some of the needs that younger generations would need and how we can facilitate that for them. So to that point, you know, what are some other challenges that you've seen uh, within this, the SIRE group you said, right? Yeah. Okay, so what are some of the challenges that you know, you've seen uh, younger generations facing that you think uh, we can immediately work on? Well, I would say um, my, from my personal experience of going through, I think, um, yeah, I've, I've now gone through many, many years of education, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It was like all of high school, college, PhD. I mean, um, and I think that I, yeah, but I, looking back, I'm like, you know, like if I had a kid now, I don't think I'd put them in the education system. Like, oh, you were, okay, that's fair. I wouldn't. No, I don't. I don't. I think it's. Um, yeah, I think it's. It's. It doesn't prepare anyone for the outside world. I think it teaches you how to answer questions, mm -hmm. but it doesn't teach you how to ask a, a really good question, right? And the problem is that now with computers and AI and Siri and Alexa. That can, that can answer any question you want, right? Like you say, you know, like you give it a physical question, you're like, I've got a ball of this kilograms and then slope at this, you know, a ramp, like how fast is it gonna go? And like, it'll tell you instantly, all right? So, but what a computer and AI can't do is to ask a really good question. And I think the greatest breakthroughs are from those who can ask brilliant questions like Elon Musk, right? Like his question was, why are rockets so freaking expensive? Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like, cause they, they blow up and he's like, so how, how do we create ones that don't have to blow up and we can reuse? And then SpaceX create, was created, right? Like, I think, I think the best breakthroughs are from, and the most creative breakthroughs are from asking a good question, but the education system doesn't teach you how to ask a good question. Um, it just teaches you how to answer a question which is now what all computers can do and as humans i think we need to um, really help facilitate what we bring to the table as as, as humans which is creativity imagination and and probing and asking kind of lateral thinking questions um, that the technology nowadays can't do um, so i think that's one major thing i think that in, in learning physics, like I loved physics, but man, was it taught poorly. Like, yeah. I mean, <laughs> even though, I mean, even it, though you were at a very good institution as well, right? But it's just, there's this formula for how to teach it. I'm like, this is the lamest way of teaching physics. Like if you're gonna teach physics for one year, like it should be, I think everything should be taught top down, right? But everything's taught bottom up, right? So in physics class, you're taught about ramps and pulleys and pendulums mm -hmm. and already i'm like snoring in the corner i'm like oh, <laughs> why why do i care um and it's not until five years later that you get to learn about quantum like the really cool stuff right but if if um sorry this is my rant but i think if if you start off a physics class and say look this is the cool stuff that people are working on like quantum commun uh computers quantum communication mm -hmm. we're trying to discover dark matter we're trying to now, you know, like part, like we've got this huge collider, CERN, or, and for instance, like quantum computers being like, look, this is what the potential of quantum computers can do. Quantum computers are composed of qubits instead of bits. How we understand qubits is via um, uh, quantum harmonic oscillators. Um, to understand quantum harmonic oscillators, you need to understand harmonic oscillators, which is a pendulum. And then I'm going to be super intrigued by any pendulum problem you throw at me because I know if I 
you know, this will be useful for me understanding a quantum computer. But if you just give me a pendulum, I'm like, I really, I really don't care about swings or big Ben clocks or like, I just, I just don't care. <laughs> you know? um, and oh man, I can rant about the education system for Ever. Well, yes, so. I mean, look, I, I, I see eye to eye with you on that for sure. And, you know, what you said about teaching bottom up rather than top down, that's that's a yeah. problem. Because when you teach top down, you're actually inspiring children or students to see what the end result can look like and what yeah. the they can have on the world, right? And at least gives them, like, if someone's going to take physics for one year, and if they know what the pro unsolved mysteries are, what people are working on, then I think that's helpful if they're working in a different field and have that knowledge. Whereas them memorizing uh, stupid formulas about ramps and pulleys, like I don't, that sure doesn't inspire anything, nor are they able to make any connections. Um, I, I think, yeah, it's just such a mm, devastatingly poor then, way of here's, teaching. Here's the thing. I Here's the thing I want to get your thoughts on. You mentioned yeah. Elon Musk and SpaceX and how he yeah. asked, okay, why are rockets sending sending rockets to space so expensive? So yeah. he thinks in first principles, right? And in order to understand first principles, isn't it important to start from the very basics first and then build, you know, from there? But I would I would say he's not he understands, he's super deep. Um but actually I've been exploring. So he has you know, his five kids, right? And mm -hmm. he took them out and I grew up in LA and he was in LA, uh, they're based in LA. And he took them out of those schools mm -hmm. and he created his own um, schools for his kids. And from my understanding, um, the way they learn things, which is the way I, I agree with is like, you give them a stereo something, stereo, and they're like, let's figure out how this works, right? Mm. And you have to pull it apart. And then you're given tools like wrenches and screwdrivers and you learn about, Hands you off. learn the tools as you're working on a certain problem rather than saying, okay, so today we're gonna focus on a screwdriver. This is a head, this is a right, like without giving the problem. So I would say, he is very much first principles, like he understands, but but he also understands like you, you don't just actually start with, you know, I think when you solve a problem, you can start with this, but um, in order to learn about your tool, you know, first present the problem, give the why, and then give the, and then give like an understanding of the tools that are necessary to understand that why rather than the tools first and then later you get the why after you've forgotten why this is like yeah, <laughs> yeah. you get you get lost at some point if you if you teach too many details and not necessarily a compass to guide which direction this is all going towards then you're you really end up to your point just studying subcomponents of subcomponents and I mean there's there's no point in that there's that that's why there's a lot of memorization right now so I want to get your thoughts on this do you think education is going to be like decentralized up to a point where you know we won't have these large institutions teaching and educating the way they do and maybe there will be a revolution in, in education anytime soon um well i i hope that the institutions that they will still exist mm -hmm. Um, and that they're smart enough to revamp within themselves. Um, because I think there, there are so many things that they offer um, that are phenomenal. So I would never want to, like my, the college days were amazing because of the people you're interacting with, right? And the inspiration that everyone brings to the table mm -hmm. is incredible. Um, and and that breadth of knowledge and um, yeah, there are aspects of it that are just phenomenal. And there's just such freedom to work on projects such as like, you know, I, I got to direct this huge show at Harvard, you know, with like, you know, 50 dancers and, and we had lights and, and something that it was such a responsibility that I never would have gotten in the real world. 
um, and would have been too stressful at the age of 20 to have mm -hmm. be in the real world if people were actually depending on me for salary and to support their family, right? Like, right. whereas a call, you know, at, at university, they offer this amazing theater space and you, you really give that, you're given that space to play, mm -hmm. um, which I think is so important. So I think that if they're able to revamp and allow that freedom of, of playfulness, um, for instance, like the Harvard Art Lab, right? Like that's a phenomenal aspect of it. Um, but I do think that if institutions um, aren't quick to change, there's no reason for them. Like I, yeah, as I said, like I personally would not encourage going through that, like the high school system again, mm -hmm. right? Like I think it's, um, I think it's silly and ridiculous to have students sitting in classroom. Um, and I think everything should be much more project oriented and um, having a, a meaning. So for instance, with my SciArt group, I, with the projects we are working on and brainstorming, it's like projects that will be helpful for other, you know, a younger group. So my, my group of SciArt is kind of start around the age of 14, 15, mm -hmm. and then upwards. Um, so the projects I give them is like projects to help students that are younger from the age of like five to 14. Um, and it just gives them so much more purpose and motivation and it makes them, because they know that age, right? Like, whereas me remembering what I was thinking about at age eight is like, I can't, like, it's impossible. <laughs> like, I'm like, I forget. <laughs> I don't even remember. Um, I can't tell the difference between my thoughts at age eight or 14. Right. But they, they know, um, and so giving purpose and meaning, I think is super important. And also putting them in the position where they're teaching, I think is also just makes them learn so much more. Um, so that's currently what we're focusing on. How to institutionalize that in the actual education system, I think is very, I don't know, I'm, ex I'm exploring this and I would love to hear people's thoughts on it. And yeah, cause, um, this is a, a big question that I'm wanting to dedicate um, most of my time towards is this education question. Yeah, I mean, to, to your point as well, if, if I had kids, I wouldn't put them through the current education system right now. I think that, you know, something close to a Montessori system of education where you take every child's strength and every child's weakness and try to curate or customize some sort of a mm -hmm. program that's relevant to them is a much more effective way of moving mm -hmm. forward rather than like you said standardized testing is all across yeah. the board. yeah but also how to do that at a large scale i mean it, the, the the problems that arise is like yeah it's very easy if you have a group of five students right but if you're talking about a country of students, how do you make this possible? And, and um, yeah, and then there are other questions of people don't even have access to education. It just <laughs> it goes down this little wormhole. Yeah. But, um, but it's yeah, worth yeah, thinking yeah. about. Certainly. It's definitely yeah. worth thinking about and it's it's a fun thing if you're passionate about it, right? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Want to, I want to minimize our conversation on education. I want to talk about okay. something yeah. I'm <laughs> very, very curious to ask you as well. I mean, it kind mm -hmm. of leaks into that, but you work in the scientific field but you also work in the arts field and you know you're kind of using two very different parts of your brain when when you're you know, doing each of those and i wanted to know how you manage to you know be very successful in in both and kind of what's your thought process or mental model around that yeah well i think it's um um there's this belief that either you have a stronger right side of your brain or a left side. Yeah. Um, and that you're either born analytic brain or a creative brain. Mm -hmm. And that if you have an analytic brain, you need to go down the science route. And if you have a creative brain, go down the art route. And I think it's such a shame that that's sort of the mentality these days, because I think that, well, A, yeah, people will say like, how do you swap brains? And I was like, if I had multiple brains, 
well, let me tell you, I was, <laughs> that'd be great. Well, the world, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, but there's only one brain, mm -hmm. which sometimes turns on and it's off and it's off. But, um, you know, it's, it's realizing that most people have both sides of the brain as well in their head. <laughs> like there is the, you know, everyone has that left side and right side brain. Um, and it's just making sure that we, you know, it's a muscle, the brain is a muscle. And so that we just work out both sides of it. And I would say, actually, you know, in the science world, that creative aspect is so important, mm -hmm. even more so like, you need to have that imagination and creativity to think of problems and to problem solve and to, you know, how to visualize like quantum and, and special relativity. Um, you, you kind of it need a very imaginative um, mentality. Mm -hmm. And also, and then and for art, like it really, you need to be somewhat analytic, um, especially or well, I, I see it, I, I don't know all art forms, but especially for dance, like mm -hmm. understanding the mechanics and understanding the physics of how the body is working and the center of mass and the torque and moment of inertia allows me having those basics down and that understanding means that my artistry is so much more free because I'm not then thinking about, you know, like, oh, am I going to be on balance or am I not? Or like, oh, like it's fingers crossed. It's like, no, I, I know the fundamentals of the physics that are necessary in order to execute the, the dance um, at a high level. So then it just gives me extra room to play with the music and to explore better artistry. So um, yeah, I think, I think both should be much more integral. And I think that realizing that the brain is just a muscle that should get worked out. Um, oh. And things get a lot easier when you bring in multiple disciplines to work on whatever that you're working on, mm -hmm. right? So if you know you're a dancer, but you're utilizing principles of physics and uh, other fields, for example, in your mind to learn new principles mm -hmm. and techniques and tips, then that helps and facilitates that learning process. Yeah. So that's why yeah. being kind of say... multidisciplinary is very important. I think it's so important. Like um, before auditions, I um, I love all the mental. I, I mean, I I think um, dance in in particular. I mean, people say it's quite physical, but for me, it's been ninety percent mental. Um, having started late and having to go through all those auditions, for me, it's like I spent a lot of time reading like the sports psychology books and and all various books and biographies and autobiographies of exceptional humans and found incredible, um, uh, I think, tips and advice in books about like, I don't know, there's like the book of like inner game of tennis or like there are books about speaking and I would read those for a dance audition where I'm definitely not saying anything. Um, or, you know, they, there are all these, there's so much to learn um, from various other fields. And, but I think it's a struggle. Like I have a hard time giving advice. I don't know what the best advice is. Um, well, mainly I tell the younger students, I'm like, listen to advice, but then don't always take it. Like <laughs> it's always so, um, but, but how to balance that breadth and depth, I think is very tricky. Um, and I, you know, I, I find that as well. I don't think there is a right answer, but one hopes that you, I think find are able to go quite deep, but also keep that breath. And it's a hard balance because there are so many hours in the day. It is, it is a hard balance, especially these days. There's so much to do, so much to learn, so many exciting and cool projects. And you mm -hmm. know, ask yourself, what do I want to get into? That's that's a question that you know myself, people younger than me, you know, younger generations, they, they're always asking, right? Like what am I supposed to do with with my life? There's so much to do. <laughs> and that's again goes back to the breadth versus depth conversation. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky one. And I yeah, and balance, like I don't think we'll ever have the right. I mean, I'm constantly um experimenting and mm -hmm. exploring and learning. So yeah. <laughs> You do you do a lot, right? So how do you how do you keep track and, and focus? Uh, that's 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 another thing with so much 
technology and so many stimulations around yeah. distractions how do you yeah. manage to keep track of what you're supposed to do when your goals and hit them um yeah i think i was writing out i think it's like different like 13 different projects that i'm working on so it does get a bit intense um like big projects mm -hmm. and for myself i focus on two max three a week um and and just or have certain days like this today is is focused on this right mm -hmm. i will train every day in terms of dance um but if it, you know and dance is sometimes on the top of that list and so then i'll train eight nine hours of, of dance that day um but generally it's like three to four um and then yeah i'll just focus on that project but it does mean that i I'm offline. Like I am not on social media. I am not replying to emails. I am not, yeah. which I'm sorry to people trying to, <laughs> I'm sorry to everyone I've replied to months later. Um, <laughs> but it's just the only way I can do it. I, I um, otherwise my whole day will be admin. Um, and so if there are important things and important deadlines, I just shut everything off and yeah. I just focus on that project um, because yeah. Otherwise, my life is work. A lot of yeah. admin. <laughs> and I don't, you know, and at the end of the day, I, I uh, yeah, I, I think you, you don't want to look back and be like, oh, I spent 80 years of my life doing, keeping up with admin. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have the admin slide off my plate sometimes and uh, beg no, for no, mercy that's, later. That's <laughs> Accomplish some projects. People <laughs> will understand once you, once you hit your goals, people, people will understand where, where you're coming <laughs> Be from. like, I'm sorry. <laughs> forgive me well we're around the 40 40 45 minute mark i really want to thank you for you know popping by really appreciate it i really enjoyed speaking with you if there's anything else that you want to talk about please feel free oh i thank you so much Reza. i really enjoyed this conversation um yeah so thank you for this opportunity of course thank you for joining take care talk to you soon <laughs> take care